atheists, agnostics, skeptics, free thinkers, whatever you like to call yourself, you are welcome here. At Seattle Atheist Church, we call ourselves an atheist church because you will never hear anything supernatural promoted from the podium. The coronavirus has affected us all in one way or another, and we hope everyone is doing well. The safety and well-being of our members is extremely important to us, so we thank you for joining us online. Our creed. Seattle Atheist Church was founded on the principles of scientific naturalism and secular ethics, which commits us on the one hand to reason and evidence-based thinking, and on the other to compassion for our fellow human beings. These commitments motivate us to oppose magical and wishful thinking and all forms of dogma, as well as to stand firmly against all forms of prejudice. Truth claims are attempted here and we stand ready to revise our thinking in light of new information. We attempt to be excellent to other conscious beings. We believe in good because good works in non-mysterious ways. If that sounds right to you, you are probably in the right place. At Seattle Atheist Church, the members ourselves give many of the talks. We have a planning meeting every quarter that's open to the whole community. That's coming up on June 16th, where we brainstorm ideas for talks we'd like to hear and give, and we schedule those talks. Um, today's talk is going to be, do you have a dragon in your garage? Um, some selections from Less Wrong. So I hand it over to you, Jack. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> so today, let's continue our journey towards better achieving our goals through rational thinking by diving once again into some material from Less Wrong. For those who aren't familiar, Less Wrong is a community dedicated to improving reasoning and decision making. They seek to hold true beliefs and to be effective at accomplishing their goals. More generally, they work to develop and practice the art of human rationality. What do they mean by rationality? Well, in the article titled, What Do We Mean by Rationality? They say, we mean two things. First, epistemic rationality, that is, systematically improving the accuracy of your beliefs. And second, instrumental rationality, that is, systematically achieving your values. Today, I wanna to talk about beliefs, about statements that might appear to be to be beliefs, but actually aren't, and about some interesting behaviors surrounding beliefs. These posts from Less Wrong are written by Eliezer Yudkowsky. I don't want to take any credit for his words here, so please direct all compliments and appreciation his way, if you will. Sometimes he writes in first person, so when you hear me say I, that's Eliezer speaking. Let's start with a useful tool to have in our toolbox that can help us determine whether to believe a proposition and that is the rationalist sentiment of making beliefs pay rent in anticipated experiences. Thus begins the ancient parable. If a tree falls in a forest and no one hears it, does it make a sound? One says, yes, it does, for it makes vibrations in the air. Another says, no, it does not, for there are no auditory processing in any brain. If there's a foundational skill in the martial art of rationality, a mental stance on which all other techniques rest, it might be this one. The ability to spot inside your own head psychological signs that you have a mental map of something and signs that you don't. Suppose that after a tree falls, the two arguers walk into the forest together. Will one expect to see the tree fall onto the right and the other expect to see the tree fall onto the left? Suppose that before the tree falls, the two leave a sound recorder next to the tree. Would one, playing back the recorder, expect to hear something different from the other? Suppose they attach an electroencephalograph to any brain in the world. Would one expect to see a different trace than the other? Though the two argue, one saying no and the other saying yes, they do not anticipate any different experiences. The two think they have different models of the world, but they have no difference with respect to what they expect will happen to them. Their maps of the world do not diverge in any sensory detail. It's tempting to try to eliminate this sort of mistake by insisting that the only legitimate kind of belief is an, is an anticipation of sensory experience. But 
that the world does, in fact, contain much that is not sensed directly. We don't see the atoms underlying the brick, but the atoms are, in fact, there. There is a floor beneath your feet, but you don't experience the floor directly. You see the light reflected from the floor, or rather, you see what your retina and visual cortex have processed of that light. To infer the floor from seeing the floor is to step back into the unseen causes of experience. It may seem like a very short and direct step, but it is still a step. It is a great strength of Homo sapiens that we can, better than any other species in the world, learn to model the unseen. It is also one of our great weak points. Humans often believe in things that are not only unseen, but unreal. The same brain that builds a network of inferred causes behind sensory experience can also build a network of causes that is not connected to any sensory experience or that is poorly connected. Alchemists believe that Claudiston caused fire. We could simplistically model their minds by drawing a little node labeled Claudiston and an arrow from this node to their sensory experience of a crackling campfire. But this belief yielded no advanced predictions. The link from Flautistan to experience was always configured after the experience, rather than constraining the experience in advance. Or suppose your English professor teaches you that the famous writer Wolfie Wilkinson, not real by the way, is actually a retropositional author, which you can tell because his books exhibit alienated resublimation. And perhaps your professor knows all this because their professor told them. But all they're able to say about resublimation is that it's a characteristic of retropositional thought. And all they're able to say about retropositionality is that it's marked by alienated resublimation. What does this mean you should expect from Wolfie Wilkinson's books? Nothing. The belief, if you can call it that, doesn't connect to any sensory experience at all. But you would better remember that Wolfie Wilkinson has the attribute retropositionality and also the attribute alienated resublimation, so you can regurgitate them on the upcoming quiz. The two beliefs are connected to each other, though still not connected to any anticipated experience. We can build up whole networks of beliefs that are connected only to each other, call these floating beliefs. It is a uniquely human flaw among animal species a perversion of Homo sapiens' ability to build more general and flexible belief networks. The rationalist virtue of empiricism consists of constantly asking which experiences our beliefs predict, or better yet, prohibit. Do you believe that Flautistan is the cause of fire? Then what do you expect to see happen because of that? Do you believe that Wolfie Wilkinson is a retropositional author? Then what do you expect to see because of that? No, not alienated resublimation. What experience will happen to you? Do you believe that if a tree falls in the forest and no one hears it, it still makes a sound? Then what experience must, therefore, befall you? It is even better to ask, what experience must not befall you? Do you believe that Elan Vital explains the mysterious aliveness of living beings? Then what does this belief not allow to happen? That is, what would definitely falsify this belief? If the answer is nothing, that means that your belief does not constrain experience. It permits anything to happen to you. It floats. When you argue a seemingly factual question, always keep in mind which difference of anticipation you are arguing about. If you can't find the difference of anticipation, you're probably arguing about labels in your belief network, the names given to concepts. Or even worse, you're arguing about floating beliefs, barnacles on your network. If you don't know what experiences are implied by Wolfie Wilkinson's writing being retropositional, you can go on arguing forever. Above all, don't ask what to believe. Ask what to anticipate. Every question of belief should flow from a question of anticipation. And that question of anticipation should be the center of the inquiry. Every guess of belief should begin by flowing to a specific guess of anticipation and should continue to pay rent in future anticipations. If a belief turns deadbeat, 
evicted. Now I'd like to talk about something close to beliefs. Very close, in fact, but not quite the same thing. I'd like to talk about belief in belief. Carl Sagan once told a parable of someone who comes to us and claims, there was a dragon in my garage. Fascinating. We reply that we wish to see this dragon. Let us set out at once for the garage. But wait, the claimant says to us, it is an invisible dragon. Now, as Sagan points out, this doesn't make the hypothesis unfalsifiable. Perhaps we go to the claimant's garage and although we see no dragon, we hear heavy breathing from no visible source, footprints mysteriously appear on the ground, and instruments show that something in the garage is consuming oxygen and breathing out carbon dioxide. But now suppose that we say to the claimant, okay, we'll visit the garage and see if we can hear heavy breathing. And the claimant quickly says, no, 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 it's an inaudible dragon. We propose to measure carbon dioxide in the air, and the claimant says that the dragon does not breathe. We propose to toss a bag of flour into the air and see if it outlines an invisible dragon. The claimant immediately says, the dragon is permeable to flour. Carl Sagan used this parable to illustrate the classic moral that four hypotheses need to do fast footwork to avoid falsification. But I tell this parable to make a different point. The claimants must have an accurate model of the situation somewhere in their mind because they can anticipate in advance exactly which experimental results they'll need to excuse. Some philosophers have been much confused by such scenarios asking, does the claimant really believe there's a dragon present or not? As if the human brain had only enough disk space to represent one belief at a time. Real minds are more tangled than that. There are different types of belief not all beliefs are direct anticipations. The claimant clearly does not anticipate seeing anything unusual upon opening the garage door. Otherwise, they wouldn't make excuses in advance. It may also be that the claimant's pool of propositional beliefs contains a free-floating statement, there is a dragon in my garage. It may seem to a rationalist that these two beliefs should collide and conflict, even though they are of different types. And yet, it is a physical fact that you can write, the sky is green, next to a picture of a blue sky, without the paper bursting into flames. The rationalist virtue of empiricism is supposed to prevent us from making this kind of mistake. We're supposed to constantly ask our beliefs which experiences they predict, make them pay rent in anticipation. But the dragon claimant's problem runs deeper and cannot be cured with such simple advice. It's not exactly difficult to connect belief in a dragon to anticipate the experience of the garage. If you believe there's a dragon in your garage, then you can expect to open up the door and see a dragon. If you don't see a dragon, then that means there's no dragon in your garage. This is pretty straightforward. You can even try it with your own garage. No, this invisibility business is a symptom of something much worse. Depending on how your childhood went, you may remember a time period when you first began to doubt Santa Claus's existence, but you still believe that you were supposed to believe in Santa Claus. So you tried to deny the doubts. As Daniel Dennett observes, where it is difficult to believe a thing, it is often much easier to believe that you ought to believe it. To repeat, where it is difficult to believe a thing, it is often much easier to believe that you ought to believe it. What does it mean to believe that the ultimate cosmic sky is both perfectly blue and perfectly green? The statement is confusing. It's not even clear what it would mean to believe it. What exactly would be believed if you believed? You can much more easily believe that it is proper, that it is good and virtuous and beneficial to believe that the ultimate cosmic sky is both perfectly blue and perfectly green. Dennett calls this belief in belief. And here, things become complicated, as human minds are wont to do. I think even Dennett oversimplifies how this psychology works in practice. For one thing, if you believe in belief, you cannot admit to yourself that you merely believe in belief. What's virtuous is to actually believe, not to believe in believing. So if you only believe in belief, 
instead of believing were not virtuous. Nobody will admit to themselves, I don't believe the ultimate cosmic sky is blue and green, but I believe I ought to believe it. That is, nobody will admit that unless they are unusually capable of acknowledging their own lack of virtue. People don't believe in belief. Uh, people don't believe in belief in belief. <laughs> they just believe in belief. As an aside in the article, uh, those who find this confusing may find it helpful to study mathematical logic, which trains one to make very sharp distinctions between the proposition P, a proof of P, and a proof that P is provable. There are similarly sharp distinctions between a proposition P, wanting P to be true, believing that P is true, wanting to believe that P is true, and believing that you believe that P is true. There are different kinds of belief in belief. You may believe in belief explicitly. That is, you may recite in your deliberate stream of consciousness the verbal sentence, it is virtuous to believe the ultimate cosmic sky is perfectly blue and perfectly green. But there are also less explicit forms of belief in belief. Maybe the dragon claimant fears the public ridicule that they imagine will result if they publicly confess they were wrong. Maybe the dragon claimant flinches away from the prospect of admitting to themselves that there is no dragon because it conflicts with their self-image as the glorious discoverer of the dragon who saw in their garage what all others had failed to see. If all of our thoughts were deliberate verbal sentences like philosophers manipulate, the human mind would be a great deal easier for humans to understand. Fleeting mental images, unspoken flinches, desires acted upon without acknowledgement these account for as much of ourselves as words. While I disagree with Dennett on some details and complications, I still think that Dennett's notion of belief and belief is the key insight necessary to understand the dragon claimant. But we need a wider concept of belief, not limited to verbal sentences. Belief should include unspoken anticipation controllers. Belief and belief should include unspoken cognitive behavior guiders. It is not psychologically realistic to say, the dragon claimant does not believe there's a dragon in the garage. They believe it is beneficial to believe there's a dragon in the garage. But it is realistic to say, the dragon claimant anticipates as if there is no dragon in the garage and make excuses as if they believe in the belief. You can possess an ordinary mental picture of your garage with no dragons in it, which correctly predicts your experiences on opening the door and never once think the verbal phrase, there is no dragon in my garage. I bet it's happened to you. That when you open your garage door or bedroom door or whatever, and expect to see no dragons, no such verbal phrase runs through your mind. Well, maybe it will now. <laughs> and to flinch away from giving up your belief in the dragon, or flinch away from giving up your self image as a person who believes in the dragon, it is not necessarily it is not necessary to explicitly think, I want to believe there's a dragon in my garage. It is only necessary to flinch away from the prospect of admitting that you don't believe. If someone believes in their belief in the dragon and also believes in the dragon, then the problem is much less severe. They will be willing to stick their neck out on experimental predictions and perhaps even agree to give up the belief if the experimental prediction is wrong. But when someone makes up excuses in advance, it would seem to indicate that belief and belief in belief have become unsynchronized. So that was the concept of belief and belief. Take a moment and reflect about your own personal experience. Have you seen this sort of thing in action? Have you seen someone say that they believe in something, but you know there's no way they believe that? Have you yourself held beliefs that were really more belief than beliefs? Do you hold any now? I'd like to hear more about them in the discussion later. Now, I'd like to move on to some other belief-like behaviors that often seem very much like beliefs, but aren't quite right. Those are professing and cheering. I, Eliezer, once attended a panel on the topic, are science and religion compatible? One of the women on the panel, a pagan, held forth interminably about how she believed that the earth had been created 
but a giant primordial cow was born into the primordial abyss, who licked a primordial god into existence, whose descendants killed a primordial giant and used its corpse to create the earth, etc. The tale was long and detailed, and more absurd than the earth being su supported on the back of a giant turtle. The speaker clearly knew enough science to know this. I still find myself struggling for words to describe what I saw as this woman spoke. She spoke with pride, self-satisfaction, a deliberate flaunting of herself. The woman went on describing her creation myth for what seemed like forever, but was probably only five minutes. The strange pride slash satisfaction slash flaunting clearly had something to do with her knowing that her beliefs were scientifically outrageous. And it wasn't that she hated science. As a panelist, she professed that religion and science were compatible. She even talked about how it was quite understandable that the Vikings talked about a primordial abyss, given the land on which they lived, explaining away her own religion. And yet, nonetheless, insisted that this is what she believed, which she said with particular satisfaction. I'm not sure that Daniel Dennett's concept of belief and belief stretches to cover this event. It was weirder than that. She didn't recite her creation myth with the fanatical faith of someone who needs to reassure herself. She didn't act like she expected us, the audience, to be convinced, or like she needed our belief to validate her. Dennett, in addition to introducing the idea of belief and belief, has also suggested that much of what is called religious belief should really be studied as religious profession instead. Suppose an alien anthropologist believed uh, or studied a group of English students who all seemingly believed that Wilkie Wilkinson was a retropositional author. The appropriate question may not be, why do all the students, uh, why do the students all believe this strange belief, but rather, why do they all write this strange sentence on quizzes? Even if a sentence is essentially, essentially meaningless, you can still know when you're supposed to chant the response aloud. I think Dennett may be slightly too cynical in suggesting that religious profession is just saying the belief aloud. Most people are honest enough that if they say a religious statement aloud, they would also feel obligated to say the verbal sentence in their own stream of consciousness. But even the concept of religious profession doesn't seem to cover the pagan woman's claim to believe in a primordial cow. If you had to profess a religious belief to satisfy a priest or satisfy a co-religionist, or heck, to satisfy your own self-image as a religious person, you would have to pretend to believe much more convincingly than this woman was doing. As she recited her tale of the primordial cow, she wasn't even trying to be persuasive on that front. She wasn't even trying to convince us that she took her own religion seriously. I think that's the part that took me so aback. I know people who, who believe they believe ridiculous things, but when they profess them, they'll spend much more effort to convince themselves that they take their beliefs seriously. It finally occurred to me that this woman wasn't trying to convince us or even to convince herself. Her recitation of the creation story wasn't about the creation of the world at all. Rather, by launching into a five minute diatribe about the primordial cow, she was cheering for paganism, like holding up a banner at a football game. A banner saying, go blues, isn't a statement of fact or an attempt to persuade. It doesn't have to be convincing. It's a cheer. That strange flaunting pride. It was like she was marching naked in a gay pride parade. It wasn't just a cheer like marching, but an outrageous cheer like marching naked, believing that she couldn't be arrested or criticized because she was doing it for her pride parade. That's why it mattered to her that what she was saying was beyond ridiculous. If she tried to make it sound more plausible, it would have been like putting on clothes. So that's all for the behaviors of professing and cheering. Have you ever seen that sort of thing in action? Where it's pretty clear that someone's impassioned professions are more like cheering or just chanting a slogan? Speaking of putting on clothes, the next belief-like behavior I'd like to talk about is belief as attire. So I, Eliezer, have so far distinguished between belief as anticipation controller, belief in belief, professing, and cheering. 
of these we might call anticipation controlling beliefs, proper beliefs, and the other forms improper beliefs. A proper belief can, of course, be wrong or irrational, as when someone genuinely anticipates that prayer will cure their sick baby. But the other forms are arguably not belief at all. Yet another form of improper belief is belief as group identification, as a way of belonging. Robin Hansen uses the excellent metaphor of wearing unusual clothing, uh, a group uniform like a priest's vestments or a Jewish skull cap. And so I will call this belief as attire. In terms of humanly realistic psychology, the Muslims who flew planes into the World Trade Center undoubtedly saw themselves as heroes defending truth, justice, and the Islamic way from hideous alien monsters, a la the movie Independence Day. Only a very inexperienced nerd, the sort of nerd who has no idea how non-nerds see the world, would say this out loud in a bar in Alabama. It is not an American thing to say. The American thing to say is that terrorists hate our freedoms and that flying a plane into a building is a cowardly act. You cannot say the phrases heroic self-sacrifice and suicide bomber in the same sentence, even for the sake of accurately describing how the enemy sees the world. The very concept of the courage and altruism of a suicide bomber is enemy attire. You can tell because the enemy talks about it. The cowardice and sociopathy of a suicide bomber is American attire. There are no quote marks you can use to talk about how the enemy sees the world. It would be like dressing up as a Nazi for Halloween. Belief as attire may help explain how people can be passionate about improper beliefs. Mere belief in belief or religious professing would have some trouble creating genuine, deep, powerful emotional effects. But my impression is this. People who've stopped anticipating as if their religion is true will go to great lengths to convince themselves they are passionate. And this desperation can be mistaken for passion. But it's not the same fire they had as a child. On the other hand, it is very easy for a human being to genuinely, passionately, gut level belong to a group, to cheer for their favorite sports team. Identifying with the tribe is a very strong emotional force. People will die for it. And once you get people to identify with the tribe, the beliefs which are the entire of that tribe will be spoken with the full passion of belonging to that tribe. And finally, there's one last belief-like behavior that I'd like to talk about. I probably should have cut it for time, but I just can't resist because I think it's a really important concept. And that is the concept of applause lights. At the Singularity Summit 2007, one of the speakers called for democratic multinational development of artificial intelligence. So I, Eliezer, stepped up to the microphone and asked, suppose that a group of democratic republics form a consortium to develop AI and there's a lot of politics in the process. Some interest groups have unusually large influence, others get shafted. In other words, the result looks just like the products of modern democracies. Alternatively, suppose a group of rebel nerds develops an AI in their basement and instructs the AI to poll everyone in the world, dropping cell phones to anyone who doesn't have them and do whatever the majority says. Which of these do you think is more democratic and would you feel safe with either? You see, I wanted to find out whether he believed in the pragmatic adequacy of the democratic political process, or if he believed in the moral rightness of voting. But the speaker replied, the first scenario sounds like an editorial in Reason Magazine, and the second sounds like a Hollywood movie plot. Confused, I asked, then what kind of democratic process did you have in mind? The speaker replied, Something like the Human Genome Project. That was an internationally sponsored research project. I asked, how would different interest groups resolve their conflicts in a structure like the Human Genome Project? And the speaker said, I don't know. This exchange puts me in mind of a quote from some dictator or other uh, who was asked if he had any intentions to move his pet state toward democracy. He said, we believe we are already within a democratic system. Some factors are still missing, like the expression of the people's will. The substance of a democracy 
is the specific mechanism that resolves policy conflicts. If all groups had the same preferred policies, there would be no need for democracy. We would automatically cooperate. The resolution process can be a direct majority vote or an elected legislature, or even a voter sensitive behavior of an artificial intelligence, but it has to be something. What does it mean to call for a democratic solution if you don't have a conflict resolution mechanism in mind? I think it means that you said the word democracy, so the audience is supposed to cheer. It's not so much a propositional statement or belief as the equivalent of the applause light that tells a studio audience when to clap. This case is remarkable only in that I mistook the applause light for a policy suggestion with subsequent embarrassment for all. Most applause lights are much more blatant and can be detected by a simple reversal test. For example, suppose someone says, we need to balance the risks and opportunities of AI. If you reverse the statement, you get, we shouldn't balance the risks and opportunities of AI. Since the reversal sounds absurd, <laughs> the unreversed statement is probably normal, implying that it does not convey new information. There are plenty of legitimate reasons for uttering a sentence that would be uninformative in isolation. The statement, we need to balance the risks and opportunities of AI, can introduce a discussion topic. It can emphasize the importance of a specific proposal for balancing, or it can criticize an unbalanced proposal. But if no specifics follow, the sentence is probably merely an applause light. I'm, I, Eliezer, I'm tempted to give a talk sometime that consists of nothing but applause lights and see how long it takes for the audience to start laughing. I am here to propose to you today that we need to balance the risks and opportunities of advanced artificial intelligence. We should avoid the risks and insofar as possible, realize the opportunities. We should not needlessly confront entirely unnecessary dangers. To achieve these goals, we must plan wisely and rationally. We should not act in fear and panic or give in to technophobia but neither should we act in blind enthusiasm. We should respect the interests of all parties with a stake in the singularity. We must try to ensure that the benefits of advanced technologies accrue to as many individuals as possible, rather than being res restricted to a few. We must try to avoid as much as possible violent conflicts using these technologies. And we must prevent massive destructive capability from falling into the hands of individuals. We should think through these issues before, not after it is too late to do anything about them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm going to leave it there for today. If any of those belief-like behaviors ring any bells for you, please let me know during the discussion. I'm interested in hearing more examples from everyday life. Thank you. <laughs>